Hello class, this is Miss Augustine, and today we're going to start chapter 14, which is about organizing the elements. So for starters, the first person to organize the elements into some sort of a chart was this fellow, Dmitry Mendeleev, and he developed the first periodic table in the late 1800s. And he organized the elements according to similarities in their properties. So if you look at this, you'll see that there are blank spots here and there. And so that was where he knew elements should be. So he arranged the elements in order of increasing atomic mass. And he arranged them so that elements with similar properties were next to one another, and as I noted, he left blank spaces where undiscovered elements should be. So if you're ever asked on a multiple choice question, who arranged the periodic table according to increasing atomic mass, ding, 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 the answer is Mendeleev. So his work gave rise to the periodic table of the elements, which is an arrangement of the elements according to similarities in their physical and chemical properties. So the next person on the scene was this fellow. His name is Henry Mosley. He was a British chemist, and he published a revised table in 1913, and he was studying alongside of Ernest Rutherford in Rutherford's lab. So Mosley measured the atomic number of atoms, and he determined that the properties of elements were based on the number of protons in the nucleus. So recall that Rutherford's experiment um, discovered the protons in the nucleus, and so he kind of expanded on Rutherford's work. Um, so he rearranged the periodic table of Mendeleev by placing the elements in order of increasing atomic number, which is the way they are on the periodic table today. So a great multiple choice question would be who arranged the elements in order of increasing atomic number in a periodic table, and the correct answer would be Mosley. So the modern periodic table, as I said, is arranged such that elements are uh, organized according to um, similarities in physical and chemical properties, which leads us to a statement of periodic law, and you should know this definition. So periodic law states that when elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number, there is a periodic repetition of both their physical and chemical properties. So the modern periodic table um, looks something like this, and there's two things I wanted to point out on this particular periodic table. I wanted to point to this little yellow, uh, it looks like a set of stairs. This has a name, it's called the line of demarcation, and the line of demarcation separates the non-metals, which are over here in the upper right hand, from the metals, and the rest of this table is metals. The second thing I wanted to point out on this table is that the group down here at the bottom um, actually fits in the table up here. So it's kind of a pullout. And this is the so-called F block on the periodic table where the F sublevel is filling. So notice that the numbering here uh, at lanthanum is 57, and then 58 through 71 are here, and then hafnium 72 is here. Similarly, 89 actinium is here, and then 90 through 103 is down here, and then 104 is up here. Um, one other thing I like to point out is the numbering. So this particular periodic table has the two sets of numbers. The honors textbook, for whatever reason, uses this 1 through 18 numbering system, and our textbook for CP chemistry uses the Roman numeral with a letter. So 1a, 2a, 3a through 8a or 0, and then the b's 1 through 8b are down here. So again, just a note that we're going to be using the um, numbering convention from our textbook. 
So the modern periodic table is separated into periods. The periods are the horizontal rows, and there are seven periods, which you'll recall correspond to the seven possible principal energy levels, and the properties change as you move from left to right across a period, and then repeat again with each new period. So the periods, as I said, are these horizontal rows, and the elements range at this point from roughly atomic number 1 to 118. And then we have the groups, which are the vertical columns, also known as families. And the elements in a group have similar physical and chemical properties. Recall that the vertical columns, the groups, all end in the same electron configuration and each group has a letter and a number, like 1a, 2a, 3a. So here is uh, the uh, an illustration showing the groups, which are again these vertical columns, and the ones that are in pretty colors are the so-called representative elements, or the A elements, and the ones here in gray are the so-called B elements, which would be your transitions, and the ones at the bottom that are not shown on this particular slide would be your inner transitions. So the representative elements are divided into three groups. You've got metals, you've got nonmetals, and you've got metalloids, and we'll take them one at a time. So the metals have, in general, high electrical conductivity, thermal as well. Um, they have high luster, that means they're shiny. They are ductile, that means that they can be drawn into wires, so think about you can't do that with a lump of carbon, but you can draw copper into a wire. They are malleable, which means that they can ha be hammered or formed into shapes, and I give you example here, there's copper looking all shiny, silver also looking shiny, and gold looking nice and shiny. So in metals, there are different types of metals um, that we like to note. So the group 1A elements are called alkali metals. They are uh, very reactive. Group 2A are the alkaline earth metals. And then in the center are the so-called transition elements. And then there's the inner transitions at the bottom of the periodic table. So going back to the group 1 alkali metals, they react violently with water. And in fact, they are so reactive that it is rare to find them alone in their elemental form anywhere on our planet. They react so readily that they typically are only found in compounds, like sodium doesn't just hang out on itself, it's usually in sodium chloride or sodium oxide. The group 2 alkaline earth metals are also very common in the earth's surface and also very reactive. So here is a look at sodium. It is usually stored in um, oil or mineral spirits because it reacts so violently with water, even water vapor in the air. And here is some magnesium just to show you a group 1 and group 2 metal. And then the transition um, metals are typically the B elements, the 1 through 10B on our periodic table. And they are uh, very commonly found on the Earth. And then you have the lanthanides and the actinides, uh, which are the inner transitions at the very bottom. And so uh, this is showing the transition metals are here, and then which would be the D block on the periodic table, and the inner transitions are the so-called F block. So now groups 3A through 7A, so we're talking about the representatives again, so I like to call them the tall guys on the periodic table. They are either going to be metals, metalloids, or nonmetals, depending on where they are with relation to the line of demarcation. The group 7As are the so-called halogens. They are highly reactive. So examples would be fluorine, which is probably the most reactive element on the periodic table. It is a gas at room temperature. Chlorine, which is also a gas at room temperature and very reactive. Bromine, which is going to go from gas to liquid very readily. And then iodine, which is a solid at room temperature, but it sublimes. It turns to a gas very readily. So then uh, we'll talk a little about nonmetals. In general, nonmetals are non-lustrous. That means they're not shiny. They're generally brittle. That means if you hit them with the hammer, they turn to powder. 
they are generally poor conductors of electricity and heat as well. Um, and they're located in the upper right hand corner of the periodic table. So here is what sulfur looks like. Here is what phosphorus looks like. And here is what carbon looks like. And you'll notice none of them are terribly shiny. And then the 8A or 0 um, group, which is the noble gases. So that would be a helium filled balloon. Um, spoiler, since they're called noble gases, they are all gases. They do not react or combine with any other element because they have a full S and P uh, energy level. So they've got S2 and P6. 2 plus 6 is 8. And 8, you will learn, is great. So they are very unreactive. And here are some examples of some neon lights, which would be made of noble gases. And then we should talk about the metalloids. And these are the elements that border on that funny line of demarcation. And so these elements have properties that are intermediate between metals and nonmetals. So they have a little bit of metallic character and a little bit of non-metallic character. And some notable examples, if you have ever heard of semiconductors, and these guys are the basis of all of our fun devices that we love, like my laptop that I'm using to make this presentation and my phone that I'm attached to. So two examples would be silicon and boron, as in Silicon Valley. That's what um, a piece of silicon looks like, and that's what a piece of boron looks like. So this is our periodic table, only this time this slide is separating it out into the nonmetals which are these orange fellows. And notice that hydrogen is over here because it has atomic number one and because it has only one S electron. And helium, which is also a nonmetal, should be here. But because it is so unreactive, it is listed as one of the noble gases. Then you'll notice the metals, which are the vast majority of elements, are green and the metalloids are blue. So for now, for part one, this is Ms. Augustine signing off.